changing the world of work for women everywhere. We are Watermark. We're the only nonprofit women's leadership organization that spans all industries. We connect, develop, and advocate for the advancement of women in the workplace. The Watermark community includes senior executives, entrepreneurs, and emerging executives that support you not only at the top of your field, but also on your way up. Thank you so much, Marlene, and um, I'm really humbled and honored to be here. It's uh, delightful to see so many excited, energetic faces this morning, and I'm always excited to talk about something that I'm super passionate about, and that is a really this gender leadership conversation, the conversation that we're not having, generally speaking, around gender. This, um, this passion really goes a long way back uh, for me um, before I really even understood workplace dynamics, before I had risen up through the ranks and become a CEO and got to kind of see that transition, before I spent a good part of my career at HP where I had great leaders that I could emulate, I continually look back on that experience and think, wow, that was amazing for me. That was foundational for me. I was really lucky to be at HP during that time. But it goes back to my first job that helped me put myself through college. I was a rangeland firefighter for the Bureau of Land Management. That's what I did. So not your normal summer McDonald's job or <laughs> babysitting job, probably. Um, and I look back, this was in the early 80s, and it was kind of an extraordinary experience, not just because I was a firefighter, but because we had really diverse teams. And you wouldn't think that that would be the case in this type of environment. So it was a small Bureau of Land Management office in Southern Oregon. And teams were divided by pumper truck. So we had small pumper trucks, about four to 500 gallons of water. Or we had large pumper trucks, that's what I was on, that held 800 gallons of water. And we had two people that were assigned to teams on small pumper trucks. And on the large trucks, there were three of us. That's how many would fit actually in the seat. And there were all women teams. There were all men teams. And there were mixed gender teams. And again, I think, how did that happen in the 1980s? But what was really interesting is even then, I started to notice that the behaviors were different of the teams based on their gender combinations. So we were often the first on scene. We would get a call and we would have to race there in our truck and then figure out what to do. If you were happened to be close by, it could be a while before someone else got there. And what I noticed is that all men teams would just race out there as fast as they possibly could without communicating. Their intent was to put that fire out and put it out now. And there was some competitiveness associated with that. The all-women teams tended to sit by and, okay, say, okay, when are reinforcements coming? Where are the roads? Um, which way is the wind blowing? You know, good questions before jumping out there. And those of us on mixed teams tended to have minor arguments from time to time <laughs> about which thing we should do. You know, there was stress and press about getting out there and being first. And it was, but wait, maybe we should communicate the plan. Who's coming next? And those dynamics, even though I was so young, I didn't have any work experience, really, I think, had an impact on the way I viewed the world and certainly have played out in the workplace. I also will tell you that when someone comes running to me as the former CEO and said, something's burning down, I had a different perspective. <laughs> Usually, something is not burning down. So I want you to think about that as a good example and illustration, because as I started to do my research around the book, one of the things that I learned is that women are now the majority in the workplace. And they often don't feel these differences in leadership behaviors until they make that first leap into a leadership position. And this was certainly true, bless you, 
Thank for you. me, um, as I moved into a leadership position for the first time at Hewlett Packard, I'd been a very successful individual contributor, and I was so excited to become a manager. And for the first time, all of my peers were male, and I was reporting to a man. And that he was very supportive. He wanted me to be successful. But I kept missing cues. I kept, there were subtle things that I just, it was like they had a secret language that I didn't know about. And I wasn't really failing. And my boss could see that I was missing the point, but he also didn't know how to help me. And I just thought it was me until years later, I started having conversations with other women who talked a lot about this, that first leap to where they really are surrounded by men and the leadership standard and the leadership behaviors are male dominated. And suddenly the groove doesn't fit anymore. And I thought, what is that? How do we pinpoint that? How do we talk about it? How do we make a difference with that? What's most interesting about this, and we're going to talk about behavior differences between men and women. And I don't know if you watched the NBC special um, last weekend, last Sunday night, about girls and what happens between age five and age six. If you haven't seen that, I would watch that because there's some pretty depressing um, information about how young girls view leaders and um, intelligence and what happens through media, culture, and education. But there's also some physiological differences. So the top brain here is a man's brain. It literally is wired for immediate action. It's wired from back to front within its own hemisphere. And the lower brain is really wired for relationships. It's wired cross hemisphere. That's a woman's brain. And they're still really learning a lot about the brain. Obviously, the studies continue. But it's also nice to know that despite cultural differences, which absolutely there are, despite generational differences, despite upbringing, there are some nuances here that are really hardwired, so to speak. So the thesis for Grace Meets Grit is really the notion that our communication styles translate later as we become leaders into our leadership styles. And our reason and purpose for communicating as men and women are largely different. So for women, think of them as the horizontal communicator. Our purpose for communicating at its very core is to establish and maintain relationships. Whereas men think of as the vertical leadership approach is really about driving immediate action and maintaining status. And failure avoidance is also really important here because if you think about failure avoidance is important because if you fail, it affects your status. So again, neither one of these is right or wrong or good or bad. They're just different. And I'm over-dramatizing for effect because we all have male and female qualities within us. And that's the point here is to embrace both, not say one or the other is better. But the more conversations we can have about the differences and the benefits of those differences and how to utilize those differences in the organization are clear. <coughs> so you can see now that I'm using grit in not the traditional resiliency way. I'm over-dramatizing partly to create a language. So I happen to be more of a grit leader, actually. And my team will often say, Dana, did you leave your grace behind today? <laughs> And I can acknowledge, yes, actually, I need to go get her. <laughs> so that's much better than men do this and women do that. Let's have a common conversation because we know there's a spectrum here. Even for men, I've had several men walk up to me after presentations and say, I am grace. And boy, do I really feel like a fish out of water. And we have that dynamic as well. So. The best way I can illustrate to you this is to think about, again, my childhood. Let's go back, rewind even further than putting myself through college. I grew up in the middle of nowhere. My dad worked on big ranches. So we would move from the middle of nowhere to the middle of nowhere. So I didn't play dolls and didn't play house. I galloped around on my pretend horse and pretended to be my favorite character on television, who at the time was Daniel Boone. And I had a friend or two who would play or role play with me in that endeavor. What's interesting about this, because we would spend hours role playing this, it's kind of amazing, 
is nobody wanted to play the role of Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca was Daniel's wife, for those of you who don't know. But all of us, me included, my friends, took turns playing Rebecca. And the reason we did that is because relationship was more important than just being Daniel Boone all the time. So even though we didn't want to play Rebecca, we didn't want to emulate Rebecca, we didn't think she had much of a role, we did it because maintaining that relationship is key. And we're going to talk about equality is so important when it comes to maintaining relationships. And this really impacts us in the workplace when women step out of an equal position. It's very uncomfortable to have a woman step up and suddenly play a role higher than you or you take over that role. And this is partly why it really disrupts the equilibrium in our relationship. So we need to get more comfortable with that, but know that that's where it comes from. It comes from a good place. So Deborah Tannen has done a lot of research on this, and I understand that Deborah Tannen's going to do some watermark events, which is fantastic. I've been a big fan for a long time. And she's really built the foundation related to different behaviors that start at a very young age between boys and girls. And basically, my thesis is really built on top of Deborah's in terms of how that translates into leadership behavior. But her research shows that girls tend to play in small groups, often pairs, just like we talked about. Even if it's playing Daniel Boone, the pattern is the same. Relationships are key. Equality is critical in those relationships, so maintaining the equilibrium in that play is key. Role-playing is part of that, maintaining the relationship and equilibrium, and the goal is maintaining intimacy. Boys have a very different approach. They tend to play in large groups. There is a designated leader. They use directive language. In fact, it might sound like ordering if you're listening to little boys. For those of you who have boys play, they're ordering each other around. There are cl clear rules, and there is an objective to the game, and that really is about winning and losing. It's a very different approach. But again, these things translate into the, the leadership space as we become leaders, even though they're unconscious and we don't think about this. And there's no question that women involvement in sports in Title IX has had a really positive impact here. My daughter is an athlete, and uh, she played volleyball and threw shot put and discus in college. She's tough. And she understands, and she's competitive. She understands the winning and losing dynamic. But that doesn't mean she's lost her grace relationship style. She is a nice blend of both. So I don't have the results for all of you. I turned in my slides um, yesterday. But for those of you that I was able to capture that went to my site and took my assessment, we have a very balanced group. I never know what this is going to be like. I can tell you that I did a, um, I presented to a group of cheerleader coaches in South Texas. And they were very grace and nothing in the middle and a couple of grit. But this group is quite balanced. We have very much grace leaders. We have very much some grit leaders. And we have a good blend in between. So you all are very balanced. And again, the point is not to say one is right or wrong, but to know your style, embrace it, understand the work environment that you're in, and figure out how to leverage that. So before I move on and really dive into the leadership behaviors, I want to talk about the conversation. So we've talked about communication styles, and I think largely, at least from my lifetime, the conversation around gender has been about equality. And it's for good reason. We still have a really large pay equity gap, unfortunately. But when I interviewed a lot of the women who were my generation before me, they were really nervous about me taking the attention off of this subject. And they were really nervous for two reasons. One was the pay equity gap. And the other one is they said, if you take and move the conversation to be about how we're different, they'll use that against of us. And then we will be, again, the second or lesser gender. And that really is not my intent here. Our intent here is to build on this. And thank goodness for the Gloria Steinems of the world and Cheryl Sandbergs of the world who are out there continuing to push the equality 
conversation. We still need to have it. I'm not saying let's not do that. I'm just dimensionalizing it, if you will, use it as a word a bit. Because we need to get to the next level. We need to have these meaningful conversations that go beyond equality. If for no other reason than talking to the men who want to be our advocates. Because they're looking for a solution and they're looking for a formula. And bias training is not solving that problem. So half the companies, it's estimated, have gone through some form of bias training. And yet there has been almost zero behavior change. And why is that? That's because... Bias training helps me understand what it's like to be a man and you understand what it's like to be a man and him understand what it's like to be a woman. And what happens when you're at the end of the quarter and you're going to miss your business results and you need to drive sales, are you going to remember what it's like to be a man? <laughs> or is he going to remember what it's like to be a woman? Probably not. So the intent here is to give us real tangible meaty relationships with work experience examples so that we can understand the differences and then leverage the strengths of both because there's a place for both actually. But because men leaders are largely still in charge, we're not making much progress because the leadership standard is how as you move into a leadership role, you will be measured against that standard even if it's not overt. It is an exclusive club even if it's not intended to be. And that is a real problem for us. The stats just validate the fact that even in my lifetime, absolutely I've seen progress, but we're not making as much progress as I would have hoped. And we'll talk a little bit at the end of how I feel like we're in this reinforcing, reinforcing negative circle of getting women in the top. There are some things I think we can do. The real great hope is that the research is now overwhelmingly positive that diverse teams perform better. Companies that have leaders and women particularly, but all forms of diversity in their leadership team perform better. But as someone who now spends her entire life dealing with leadership teams, I have learned over and over again, whether it's style, age, gender, culture, you name it, it's not easy to have a diverse team. It's actually very difficult. It requires good leadership. It requires good management. And I feel like that's how my whole life is spent now, helping diverse teams become more functional. Um, and that's not an easy task. I have one company who literally had, was using an assessment to hire the same profile to their leadership team. Can you imagine? So much for diversity, and also imagine what you might miss. But they really, that feels comfortable. It's much more comfortable. So that's the hurdle that we have to overcome. So in Grace Meets Grit, I focused on six different leadership behaviors um, for varying reasons. I focused on inspiring because I think women have a really unique opportunity to be a truly inspirational leader in a unique way, and less than 5% of employees believe that they don't work for one, which is really pretty sad, actually. I chose driven because of this tendency for men to be immediate action focused, and yet there's a lot of data that shows that women are very much results driven. We just may do it a different way. And so understanding that is key. And actually decisive is even worse. It's the most biased leadership behavior that there is. And the reason I wrote the book, I was walking through the halls of Zenith Media in New York as a CEO and checking on a couple of other women CEOs, because there aren't many in the holding company world. I was talking to one young woman's boss. And he says, yeah, I don't think she's going to work out. And I was shocked, because she was amazingly talented, great with clients, great with her team. And he said, yeah, it turns out all the great ideas come from her team. And, you know, she doesn't really make any decisions herself anyway. <laughs> and to a certain extent, there was a, a kernel of truth in there in the sense that she was a very inclusive decision maker. And guess what? You all are very inclusive decision makers, according to the data that I gathered in doing my assessment. Most women are. And that's a very positive thing for the organization. But because he couldn't relate to that, 
there's actually a very interesting study that psychologists assume that under stress, all people would become more self-centered because it's more efficient. You take care of yourself under stress. And they found that that is true 100% of the time for men only. <laughs> Women reach out to others under stress. So if you are a leader in your organization, wouldn't you want to know that and leverage that? Because again, both are helpful. Let's figure out how to tap into that. Confidence, if you've done the work with Katty Kay and Claire Shipman, there's a lot of research on confidence. And going back to the um, conversation about the young girls that NBC, the study that NBC did, um, where we could use some help. And so finding that confidence kernel that's inside you, for me, it's thinking about being on my horse when it's about to flip out. And turns out the same things that calm a crazy horse also really show confidence. Um, so that's my touchstone, but you know, helping groups find touchstones is key. Power we're going to dive in and talk more about. Um, it's become a really hot topic since the election. I can't imagine why. <laughs> And lastly, resilience, because we as women, I think Marlene, you said this right off the bat, we don't often invest in ourselves. And part of investing in ourselves is building our own personal resilience. That's our own true grit with a classic definition. And if you are a resilient leader, you'll have a resilient team. But we often put ourselves to last. So let's dive into power and explore just a little bit. So I'm going to define power right off the bat as influence potential. Because all of the research on power shows, and I'll share this with you in a minute, that women often misunderstand what power is and how it benefits them. So I want to redefine it and help you think of it as influence potential. Because if you're in charge, if you're leading a team, getting the most potential out of them is part of your job. So that's the power that you're holding in your hand. You don't have to do it in the traditional negative connotation that many of us have related to power. But think of it as really that potential, that opportunity within the organization. So unfortunately, the data shows that women don't perceive power this way generally. They perceive it as passive. So if it's influence potential, that in my mind feels like it's somewhat internally. But the data shows most women think it's external. It's bestowed upon you. It's like I'm giving you power today. You don't emanate it or doesn't come from within. So I'm challenging you all to think about power as come from within. And I was very pleased in the test and the, in the assessment to see that you all answered the question saying, I do believe that power helps me be successful. That is power from within. So this notion of power being external, and it's about a decide and announce culture. So to me, this research indicates that we've all had some bad leaders of truly this is what power is about. Uh, power is about maintaining influence over others. So again, it's kind of that, you know, negative connotation. And then I want you to remember power does impact relationships. So it might be uncomfortable and that could be the source of our uncomfortableness in addition to the bad conditioning of leaders that we may have had. Men, on the other hand, have a very different approach. Power is continually negotiated. It's vital to personal and professional success, so it very much comes from within. Authority is demonstrated in every action and interaction. I like to talk about it like breathing. Power is like breathing for men. It's just that natural. It's that integrated. Um, as Deborah Tannen would say, power is achieved through ritual challenging. So how many of you are familiar with the notion of ritual challenging? I know you have seen it. My husband taught me ritual challenging. He would say something absolutely outlandish that I knew wasn't accurate, and I knew that he knew it wasn't accurate. But he said it so convincingly, I begin to question myself. Right? It's like, well, wait, may maybe I don't know that. But what I've learned is that's a standard practice. It's like a theory. Let's test my idea. You put it out there, and if no one challenges it, well, then you just move on. And boy, doesn't that explain so many things, you say. Right? So I worked with a group of women engineers who said, what 
how I see this all the time in my engineering group. What happens? How do I stop this behavior? And I said, you stop it by using facts. You say, of course, that's not true because X, Y, and Z. And now we're moving on to a more productive conversation. Thank you very much. I didn't even know it had a name. It has a name. Stop, stop your ritual challenge. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to do. <laughs> then you sound very authoritative. And, yes. But now it drives my husband crazy because I just say, no, of course that's not right. And you know that. <laughs> Power is about everyday actions and words. Like I said, it's about breathing. And the thing to remember here is power enables status. This is why it's so comfortable, right? It really does enable status. You acting the role, and this is tied very tightly to confidence, acting the role is just as important as embracing it. So I want to, you to think about as you leave in this notion of power, it's not about having power over others, it's about empowering others. So as I was the CEO of Performix, that was what was really cool to me. If I saw a problem, I could fix it. I felt like I was helping all of those people achieve their own interpersonal goals. That was what really excited me. It wasn't about being in charge or telling others what to do. That is the opportunity that we have as power. Now, there was a very interesting article that was published, I think, two weeks ago in The Atlantic, if you didn't see this. The title is Power Causes Brain Damage. And it's fascinating, actually. It showed that the longer that people are exposed to power and in a position of power, they lose the ability to really see themselves clearly and see how others see them. So they had um, these people say, you know, write an E on your forehead in the way that others would see it. And the people, the longer they had been exposed to power, the more often they were like to write the E that from their own perspective, not others which is fascinating. They also began to display very reckless behavior, high risk taking behavior, <laughs> some bad things. So, um, so I'm going to call it, you know, this hubris syndrome is really power sickness. So there is a downside to power, but I think if your relationship core and base helps balance that a bit. And I've reached out to the researchers to find out if there is a distinction between women and men and our power sickness. But the thing to remember is perspective is what cures all. So I continually work on perspective maintenance. So this is my granddaughter on my horse, and I have a giant horse and a tiny granddaughter, right? And that's perspective, right? She's up there, he's big, she's small. Feeling that, remembering what that feels like, or I spend a lot of time in the West. I live outside Jackson Hole. I ride my horse and feel very small there. I think that's a positive way to kind of maintain your power balance. And I think that focus on others and empowering others can all help us in terms of maintaining that balance. All right, so one of the things I tie Everything in the book, too, is really transformational leadership. And when I started on this journey, I had no idea that there were three forms of leadership. These are not new concepts. They actually were formed in the 1970s by James Burns, who was a presidential biographer. And he talked about transactional leadership, which is really more a leadership for the industrial age. It's if you do X, I'm going to give you Y. It's very transactional, non-motivational, very simple. There's transformational leadership, and these are some of the characteristics. I would call this more charismatic leadership. You really have an invested interest in your followers. And you're thinking about helping them to be successful. Not only helps the company, but individually. You have an individual vested interest. And then I, the third form of leadership is laissez-faire. And I think we've all had laissez-faire leaders. They're the ones who are pretty much checked out until there's an emergency and suddenly they're engaged. But transformational leadership is really making a comeback. And I thought of, as I learned this, I thought, where, where did I learn transformational leadership? I really believe I learned it from my time at HP when I was there. And actually, I republished the HP way in my book because they really, it's gotten lost. It's really not used today, which is kind of sad. But it really has the foundational principles of transformational leadership. And why this is so important today is because millennials will demand it. 
you all, as you're largely entering this workforce, you will not work for organizations where you don't have transformational leaders. And there's been over 44 studies now that have shown that the best way to actually get transformational leaders into your organization is to hire women because they naturally are transformational leaders. So there's a huge opportunity for us here on this tipping point. So lastly, a couple things to think about. Um, this is 2012. I'm trying to get an updated um, notion of this, but I want you to have a look and see where women are likely to be your boss in the world. Look at the list for a minute. We're 15, US is 15 down the list, but what stands out to you on this list? Just shout your answers out. Caribbean. Non-developed countries, yep. Countries of color, very good. Diverse countries. They tend to have cultures that are very relational. Yes, Latin culture is very relational with powerful women. All of these things, great answers. Yes. Yes, matriarchal, very good. Yes, with women leaders already in place, far ahead of us from that standpoint. Yes. So when I published the book at the very last um, really little vignette at each leadership behavior chapter, I published stories, real stories, of women leaders you've probably never heard before. So where were, were, were women given first voting rights in the United States? Do you know where? What state? Yes? Wyoming extremely early, actually, before it even became a state. First woman governor. Wyoming. First woman justice of the peace. Wyoming. First all women town council. Wyoming. First woman town marshal. Wyoming. First all woman jury. Wyoming. It's amazing <laughs> and really sad if you look at Wyoming today. We won't go there. <laughs> but there are some similarities. Wyoming was really the wild, wild west. It took every family member had to have a meaningful role to actually survive. If you're going to live at 6,000 feet elevation in an 8 by 8 hut um, with you know, no snow plows, which if you live in my neighborhood and you get an average of 120 inches of snow a year or more, um, it's tough. And I think... There's some similarities here, you know, needing all hands on deck. And I don't think that's that dissimilar to where we are in the workplace today. It takes two families to survive. It takes two workers generally in the family to try to make ends meet. And I think calling on our roots and kind of remembering that there was a time when women really did have very strong positions. So you think of the all women town council. For those of you who've been in Jackson Hole and walked on the elevated sidewalks around the square, those women built those sidewalks because they were tired of dragging their skirts through the mud, taking their children to school. And in fact, two of them had husbands that were on the town council and they brought up the idea and they were like, yeah. And so they all ran against them and kicked them out <laughs> and built the damn sidewalks, right? <laughs> so there is an opportunity here. So how do we get more leaders today? Because it is kind of sad that we are in this vicious cycle. And one of the things I think we need to keep in mind is that having women in leadership positions will help get more people in leadership positions. So this CTI study, the, Sound, the Center for Talent Innovation, did an amazing study globally talking to both women who were in leadership positions and women who weren't in leadership positions. And both groups had a very similar five-point value proposition. They wanted to flourish in their role. They want to excel within the company. They wanted to reach for meaning and purpose. Their job needed to stand for something bigger than the job itself. They wanted to empower others, and they wanted to earn well. But what's mo what was most fascinating is that women not in a power position believed that they could only get one of those. Which one? earning well. That's, they said, really, if I'm in a power position, I have a better paycheck, but it's not going to do anything else for me. 
Ironically, women holding a position of power said, oh yeah, my job at this power position gets me four of the five. Which one did they not think their job gave him well? <laughs> so we're stuck in this position. If really these young women don't believe that their role gives them anything else but a good paycheck, we're kind of not going to make much progress there because having that role needs to be more meaningful than just a paycheck. All right, sadly though, and I didn't actually believe this stat, it came out after my book was published. One of it, out of every four Americans works for a company where there are no women in leadership, none. I spend time leadership coaching. My, my largest client is a private equity firm, and I do all of the coaching for their portfolio companies. And this is the case in many locations, and they're located all over the United States. Um, employ a lot of people, good, diverse set of companies in terms of the industry mix, et cetera. But the women are not to be found with the exception of healthcare companies. And we need to fix that. I came out of the advertising industry. It's a very biased industry. And in addition to being very biased, it's also we're losing women at a younger age. And I think this is true across the board. So when I went to Performix and was CEO, I was probably 45, 46. My team approached AdAge about submitting my name as the women to watch. And they came back and told me, they said, well, they said you're kind of old. <laughs> really? There are ancient men at the top of the holding companies was my, <laughs> I mean, like in their 80s. <laughs> um, but we're losing women before they reach their peak. The data shows that women don't reach their peak of their careers until age 60. Now, there's a lot of questions about why this is, is that we're distracted early in our careers. As one of my friends says, she said, that's because we have to work twice as hard to be thought of as half as good. So we're constantly working on self-improvement. We just care more. I just shared this with a, a, all men senior leadership team, and they just laughed. Because women do work on self-improvement a lot longer than men as well. And so how do we retain those women in those organizations? I get it why they're leaving. I totally understand. I'm one of them. I left. But how do we get them to keep and sustain in the organization and help them survive? And I actually believe having this dialogue, having this language will help us do that. So your inspiration for today is the best leaders embrace power. Not in the traditional old school way of thinking of power, but think about it in the new defined way. Transformational leadership will win. I think you all are going to save us from that standpoint. We will have better leaders because this generation and the Gen Z generation after the millennial generation will demand it. And that's not a bad thing. And then please help me in joining the Grace Meets Grit conversation. It's in. Be part of it and join me. Thank you so much for having me this morning. All right. How are we on time? Are we okay? I have a couple of minutes? Okay. I'll start with you. Yeah? Okay. I'm not going to you next. Thanks, Valerie. Hello. Hi. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Sure. And my dad is from Wyoming, so oh. I spent a lot of a lot of time out there. Um, so I am one of the grits, which yes. I was I knew I would be, but mm -hmm. I was kind of hoping I would be more middle. And <laughs> I work in human resources, and so what I mm -hmm. find is that my style, I have to. It's not my normal inclination to lead with the relational, although I want the relational yeah. connection, but it's a very much dominated by women field. Yes. Yeah, and so. I do notice a difference. So are there tips that you might have for someone being grit in a very grace environment? Yes. Um, I will say I understand that problem. I'll find myself immediately sending an order email and think, wait a minute, I need to start with, hello. Exactly. <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> Did you have a nice weekend? <laughs> but that's not normal for me. <laughs> it's hard. So I, I do I that. I go back and put it in as well. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, and then I have had coworkers again tell me. So I think if you can start the dialogue and say, you know, I think with any style difference doesn't have to be, you know, my lens, but any lens, as you know, in HR, having that conversation about this is more my style and help embrace the others and have that 
conversation about what that translates into and use the language so they can tell you, Valerie, did you forget your grace today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Here at Watermark, we work a lot with our network on helping women leverage the relationships in our network totally. because we find that in general, men are better at leveraging that relationship yes. network. How do you reconcile that with your data that shows that women are more relational in playing yes. games and as they grow up? That's a little bit different than investing in yourself, though. So a couple things on networks. So McKinsey research, you're probably very aware of, that men's networks are primarily comprised of men. Women's networks, while slightly more diverse, are mostly comprised of women. This is why we have women stuck in binders, folks. Um, so networking is important. When I left Performix, um, I remember my male, um, successor said, you know, we'd like to hire more women, but we could just can't find any. And I, and I, so I sent them 10 resumes. I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, but it is real. And so investing in that in yourself, which I think also ties less to relationship and more about power and confidence and touting your own horn, which is also somewhat uncomfortable, network falls into that camp of investing in yourself. And I will never forget being at HP and walking around with a CMO who at the time, this is before we really had smartphones, he was walking around with a little digital computer and all he did was maintain the CMO's network. And I was like shocked at that. But the guy got invited to Bill Clinton's you know, summit every year. And he was the most connected person you can imagine. I remember thinking about that. Wow, that it makes a difference. And so we do need to invest in ourselves and think about those connections. And, and if a guy calls you up out of the blue, like one did yesterday to me, which I knew he wasn't calling for a social call because I hadn't heard from him in like three years, I was ready to ask for something in return because I knew he was going to ask me for something. And he did. At the end, he turned around and he was nice enough to say, and what can I do for you? And I was prepared. So think about that because we don't often think about that. We graciously give, but we don't think about receiving. So be prepared to ask for something in return. I'll let you pick. Hi. Okay. Um, you said in one of the teams you were the only woman team member um, among the other men members. Yes. And you also said that um, it went really well, but sometimes you missed to see the cues. I did. How do you actually look for the cues and how do you find it? Yes, and so how do you make sure what you get what you want yes. or, and be a part of the team and yes. you know make a difference right yeah. there? And just to be fair, you might not ever be truly a part of the team. That's, I think, part of it's. It's a hard place to be. But I'm hoping through some of the examples in the book, it understanding the status and what drives them. So for example, I'll give you an example my daughter um, provided me. She's 28 and I invited her to one of my workshops in January and she said, mom, it's probably a good time thing you invited me. I got in trouble for an email this week. And being a mom, I was like, do you mind if I look at the email? You know, you never want to assume. So she shared it with me and the email thread went something like this. It was the CEO of the company, who was not her boss, she reports to the next level down, sent a note to her as well as all the other mid-level managers and said, Mesa, please let me know if there will be information ahead of next Thursday's meeting. And she replied, there will not be any information ahead of time, but I will have some materials at the meeting. And she got nailed. What did she do? She missed the cue that that was saying provide that like that was a direct. He was asking for help. He was he was saying I need it. He was there. even and if he didn't say that. It, right? Yep, yep. He was asking for help. He didn't want to go in unprepared. She totally missed the cue, and by responding back and saying replying to all and saying there won't be any, she broke status completely. She blew it out of the water. But see how subtle that is. And until I explained it to her, she was like, oh. It makes so much more sense now. I kept want looking at the words. So, Well, there's a lot of things it says about the culture. And you're right, it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> we could go down a whole other path there, you're right. But the subtleties were, in my case, that small. Like, 
everyone else would send a summary email ahead of time in front of a meeting listing all the things they had done. He didn't ask for that. Why was I it? supposed to know that? I mean, you know, what if we lived in a world where there could be better understanding that you won't know that, but he expects it, and that we can have better communication? Why wouldn't he just ask for it? <laughs> you have to remember, he's working in a world of men. He doesn't have to do that today because they all just know. And again, we're being held against that male standard, and that was for me. You know, they were all men. They just knew. They had never had to explain to anyone before okay. and felt like they didn't have to do it to me. That may or may not be right, but it was a reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hands over I'm letting you just decide. <laughs> I was actually just going to pick up on the thread mm -hmm. that you just yeah. started because there's an, another um, uh, approach that you can think about. I, it's, it's one thing to say that men don't, think about telling what they need. They simply put yeah. it out there generally. My, my husband and I go through this all the time. <laughs> He's a very much a generalist. If, if it could be this way, it would be nice. And I wish he'd just say, you know, that's what I want. Yeah. That's, I, and we run into that not just with men. It's that sometimes there are people who don't want to put their wish out because they feel vulnerable and it's a risk. And so they cover it by saying, well, everyone should need this, mm -hmm. so it should be there. I, I think our role is to probe, yeah. which is what I would have done in that situation. Say, what are you asking for? Now, is there something you might yeah. need before exactly. the meeting, not just the outcome? So yeah. I think it, it has to do with emotional intelligence and realizing is there something missing here? Let me probe further before I answer. And, and quite frankly, most of these men I coach don't have a lot of EQ. <laughs> um, and they actually, it gets even a, a layer further, they expect everyone to adapt to their own leadership style and approach, which again, I, if I could get them all with horses, it would be great because you, know, you could tell a horse all day long, if they don't want to do it, they're not going to. And so, you know, working, I think, helps you better adapt yourself to be leaders. But you're right. You're very, mu you're very much right. They don't often aren't good at saying what they need. Maybe n don't even know that they need it. I mean, that's the other sad thing. Yeah. I, I snagged the microphone because I want to draw on that. So many years ago, I took a dance class. And I was always like, one step ahead of my partner, and they got really frustrated, and they <laughs> said, don't anticipate what I'm going to do. And I was like, hmm, okay. Interesting. Well, on the dance floor, like, okay, you go with it. You're, that's what you're supposed to do. But what I learned is, for me, what's helped me is to anticipate mm -hmm. what the questions are going to be. Mm -hmm. What and, and when I'm role-playing with my team, I always say, let's anticipate what the hard questions yeah. are going to be. Let's anticipate Great. what Great. our leadership is going to ask for. Let's try to be ahead of this so we can come with solutions and options rather than yes. have to react. And just like any other leadership style, trying to put, you won't completely do this well, but trying to put their lens on having that perspective helps you anticipate with those questions as well. Style difference, whatever. Great, great. So I'm getting the cue that right. uh, while we can continue this conversation, I'm getting the cue that we want to wrap this up. All right. Well, thank so. you so much. So thank you. I really much. appreciate it.